Saturday. Um, I am Bill Adair. I am the Knight Professor at Duke University. Uh, I am also the creator of PolitiFact, the fact-checking website in the United States. And I am the organizer of a uh, fact-checking conference coming up in London, the first ever uh, global summit of fact-checking uh, that uh, I'm very excited about. And this is actually kind of a preview of that conference. Uh, all of uh, the panelists joining me today are going to be at that conference. And so um, we're going to be uh, doing sort of a dry run of some of the conversations uh, today that we'll be having in London. So. Uh, very excited that you could join us. Um, uh, we're going to uh, have a really interesting conversation today. Um, fact checking is uh, is a relatively new movement in journalism, and uh, and I'm really proud to be part of it. I'm very passionate about it as uh, uh, someone who uh, got into it really out of my own guilt as a journalist. I started in fact checking because I had been covering the the uh, Bush administration, the Bush White House, and I was not doing enough fact checking and felt guilt uh, and felt that I needed to be doing more fact checking. So I proposed PolitiFact. So uh, let me introduce uh, quickly our panelists and then I'm going to do a little introduction of an overview of how fact checking has been growing around the world and then we're going to have a pretty wide-ranging discussion about a lot of different topics of fact-checking. Uh, so first let me start by uh, introducing uh, the panelists. So if you're tweeting any of this, um, my uh, Twitter uh, name is Bill Adair Duke. Um, joining me uh, to my left is Peter Cunliffe Jones, uh, the executive director of Africa Check, and he is P. Cunliffe Jones on Twitter. And uh, to my left is uh, Pietro Curatolo, uh, the co-founder of FactCheck EU, uh, and his Twitter uh, handle is his name. And to my right is Will Moy, the director of Full Fact uh, from the UK, uh, with uh, the name Puzzles the Will on Twitter. And uh, our hashtag, we try to keep it short, is FactIJF. Uh, so if you're tweeting anything, uh, hope you'll use that hashtag. Um, so I thought um, I would start with some, just an overview to give you an idea about fact-checking around the world. Um, so uh, I, in the last couple of months, uh, been working with a student at Duke to take a survey of fact-checking around the world and, and get a handle on how many fact-checking sites there are. And we were surprised to find there is a lot more fact-checking fact-checking going on than we thought. So let me first define what I'm talking about when I say, okay, <laughs> let me define uh, when I, what I mean when I say fact-checking website. So we're talking about a journalistic fact-checking organization. So this, uh, this is not a partisan fact-checking site. Uh, this is a, uh, either a dedicated fact-checking organization that is separate from a news organization or a dedicated uh, reporter or staff within a, an established news organization. Uh, so when, uh, when we plotted all of the sites we found around the world, it was really quite impressive. Um, look at that, fact-checking sites ev uh, on uh, all continents, uh, except Antarctica. We're still looking for some penguins uh, to start some fact-checking. Um, but uh, down in South America, we have fact-checking in Chile and Argentina. Uh, in, of course, South Africa with uh, Peter's organization. Uh, we have three fact-checkers in, uh, in Australia. Uh, we have some in India that is just starting up with the elections in India. Uh, we have lots of fact-checking in Europe and, uh, and in uh, North America in the United States. Uh, so just to uh, take a, a, little more, a little closer look at the numbers. Uh, we've counted 63 fact-checking sites that have been active in the past three years, including 45 that are currently active. Um, and uh, uh, the continent with the most is, uh, is Europe. <coughs> Recognizing um, we, uh, we did this map in Google Fusion and we did hack the geocodes a little bit <clears throat> so apologies to Pietro, um, his site actually appears in Switzerland, um, <clears throat> so sorry. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, 
we were trying to make sure it didn't didn't get uh, overshadowed there in Rome. Uh, so, uh, and in the United States, uh, fact checking, um, uh, a lot of those sites are PolitiFact sites. PolitiFact has a very unique structure with PolitiFact National, with Pundit Fact, which uh, is a branch that fact checks pundits and talk show hosts, uh, which uh, many people have likened to shooting fish in a barrel. Um, and, uh, and then PolitiFact also has uh, affiliates in uh, eight different states, so PolitiFact, Oregon, PolitiFact, Texas, uh, Wisconsin, Virginia, where news organizations in those states have licensed PolitiFact, uh, and then other fact checkers also around the, the United States. So all in all, very, uh, very impressive, the amount of fact checking that's going on around the world. A um, few more things here before we get into some more details about our panel. Uh, there's been rapid growth in fact-checking in the last two years. There have been 27 new sites that have started since January 2012. Uh, about half are part of legacy news organizations, um, newspapers or, or television networks. Uh, the other half are run by either startup companies uh, or not-for-profit uh, organizations or NGOs. Um, 23 of the sites um, track campaign promises, so they will look at the statements that uh, people made when they were running for office, and then they go back and they rate whether those campaign promises were achieved. Uh, a couple of examples here, the Morsi meter, um, which was uh, in Egypt tracking the campaign promises of Mohamed Morsi. Um, uh, never actually completed, uh, it's interesting, uh, when you have a coup, it sort of stops the ability of the uh, executive from completing their promises. Um, in the case of uh, the Obometer, uh, it's a PolitiFact feature that uh, is tracking the campaign promises of President Obama. Uh, in, our, in our case, uh, we did that. We sort of wish that John McCain would win uh, because McCain made only a few dozen promises Obama made uh, 500, so we were sort of wishing McCain would win. It would have meant a lot less work. Uh, more than two-thirds of the uh, fact-checking sites around the world use ratings, and when I say ratings, I mean um, ratings like the truth -a meter um, on PolitiFact. In PolitiFact, they uh, rate things from true, mostly true, half true, mostly false, false or the lowest rating, pants on fire. Um, and that is uh, a rating that summarizes most of the fact checks. Um, the Washington Post fact checker uses Pinocchio, um, and they award one to four Pinocchios to every statement. Um, this is from Politico Metro. They use a thermometer. And then uh, uh, Pietro's uh, fact check EU uses a, a system of true to my favorite rating, insane whopper. Um, which I just love, and uh, they have this cool feature that allows you to select, you can see which country has the most insane whoppers. Uh, which, and so we could look here, what is that? I guess that's Italy, gosh. Unfortunately, yeah. What does that say about <laughs> Italy? Um, so uh, very cool, and that shows you some of, the, some of the fun that you can have with this journalism. Um, it's, uh, it's serious and important journalism, but, uh, but it's important to present it in a lively way, and one of the things we want to talk about today is the importance of doing that. Um, and then let me just sum up with a couple of points uh, that we're going to be talking about today. Um, so challenges. Um, Fact-checking is costly um, and time-consuming. One of the things that all of us hear is, uh, hey, can you uh, give me a fact-check right away, um, sort of live fact-checking, and uh, if only it were that easy. Um, you know, the dream is the live fact check, and uh, we can talk a little bit about that, how we try to do live fact checking during an event, like a debate. Um, and it is possible to tell people about a statement um, that you have fact checked before, um, but uh, uh, the, the dream of sort of, you know, the politician utters the statement and the instant fact check, you know, it's just a dream. Um, the best you can do is, if you have fact-checked that before, present that information. So we can talk about that. 
Um, fact checking is costly and time consuming. That's not what editors and news directors want to hear, um, but it's, uh, it's the, the hard reality of this business. Um, also, it's not profitable. Um, uh, I have looked at uh, all of the 63 sites around the world, uh, and from what I've seen so far, none of them are freestanding profitable businesses. And so this is public service journalism. It is vital, important journalism, but it is not going to make a profit. And so as we think about sustaining this important journalism, we have to find good funding sources and we have to get people in journalism uh, to realize that it is every bit as important as investigative journalism uh, and that they need to make a commitment to it regardless of whether it's profitable. Um, I'll, I'll occasionally get asked by my colleagues in political journalism, are you making a profit yet at PolitiFact? And, uh, um, and my answer is, you know, PolitiFact is no more profitable than an investigative team at a newspaper, but it is every bit as important. Um, uh, fact checking is controversial. Um, it manages to make everybody mad, and uh, that is uh, a real challenge, uh, particularly in a very partisan environment like we have in the United States. On any given day, PolitiFact can make pretty much everyone on both sides of the spectrum mad, and um, that's not a great recipe for business success, um, but it is great journalism, and it's great fun. Um, so you have to have thick skin to be in this business. Uh, and then uh, finally, one thing I'd like to talk about today is how editors lose interest in fact-checking after election day. And this is a real problem around the world. Uh, we saw this in Australia, where our affiliate PolitiFact Australia was going strong, and then after election day, uh, the, the TV network that was paying for PolitiFact Australia said, great, great work, loved it, see you guys, um, we'll see you at the next election. And there is this perception, not just in Australia, but in the United States, and I know here in Italy and, and in many other countries, that for some reason fact-checking is something you do during campaigns, but the editors seem to think that the need to fact-check ends on election day. And that's really silly and, um, and I think wrong-headed. Um, we all know that politicians don't stop lying on election day. And so we need to keep fact-checking as they're governing, just as we did while they're campaigning. So with that, um, what I thought we would do is uh, go down the, the table and uh, have each of the panelists talk about uh, their websites, how they got started, and then uh, we'll mix it up a little bit. So Pietro, why don't we start with you? So, um, Fact Check EU is probably the youngest website uh, in this panel. And I'm talking about the age of the website, not the speakers. Um, we launched only a few months ago, but we're actually building on the experience of Pagella Politica. It's an Italian fact checking website which we launched about a year and a half ago and which gained significant traction ahead of the Italian general elections about a year ago. And uh, so the idea was to try and replicate this on a European level to cover the European elections that will take place in about three weeks. And we saw there was no pan-European fact-checking platform that was actually covering the EU. And so we thought, okay, let's try it and do this. So what we do is we fact-check statements made by the main candidates to the presidency of the European Commission, uh, members of the European Parliament, and also national leaders uh, at, the, at the national level when they talk about the EU. And then we rate these statements on a scale from uh, true to insane whopper. <laughs> um, the, there are two main aspects I would say that make our website a little different from the others represented here. And one is that it's available in uh, six languages. So we have the website in uh, English, French, German, uh, Italian, Spanish, and Polish. And uh, this is at the same time, it's a challenge and an opportunity for us. So on the one hand, it requires constant translations, so it makes things far more complicated. But on the other, we did not want to have a website that was only, that only reached the English-speaking community in Brussels and somewhat remained a thing for the Eurobubble. 
And so the idea was to try and reach a broader audience that does not follow EU politics on a daily basis. And by having different languages, we managed to tap into national markets. Uh, the second aspect that characterizes our website is uh, crowdsourcing. So we, we would like the website to be mostly crowd-driven. That means that we, um, users can create their own profile on the website and they can do a number of things. They can either uh, just upload a statement they come across and they want us to fact check. Um, they can submit their own uh, fact check, which we will then peer review internally prior to publication. And they can uh, submit translations of fact, checks, of fact checks we already published in English and thus making it available in the other languages as well. Um, on the other hand, we also try to somewhat increase the credibility of the crowd uh, by partnering with uh, think tanks and uh, other fact checking websites in Europe that do it only on a national level. So we get them to um, fact check as well and uh, this somewhat creates a more, uh, a more respectable crowd. And uh, the idea of the crowd is that it creates a sense of ownership for the, um, the users that upload their, uh, their fact checks. And uh, the users are then ranked and, uh, and rated on the quality of their contributions. So this somewhat uh, sets into motion a, a sort of competition between uh, users for who has the best ratings. Um, in a way, as with the languages, the idea is to make the, the campaign for the European elections more engaging. So we're reaching out to users directly and encouraging them to participate directly. Um, so in a way, it's, uh, our ambition is not only to have a website that works as a sort of watchdog for um, what politicians are saying and making them more accountable, but also create awareness of, uh, of EU politics and themes that are not well known to the general public but are equally important. And, uh, and in a way, the, the idea is to not, not create ourselves, but contribute to the creation of a, of a European demos and, uh, and raise awareness on European issues. So basically we might have, we might show to a Polish reader a statement made by a Spanish politician that he had no idea of, but it's still important and it's relevant because it's on EU topics. And I would say our uh, feedback so far has been uh, very positive. We, we've launched only in February this year, and we are looking to run until the end of May for the European elections, because we are uh, we're relying on a, on a grant uh, from, a, from a German foundation. And uh, as Bill mentioned in the, in the introduction, we hope the interest will not wane after the elections, and there will, be, there will continue to be uh, an interest in taking forward the uh, fact-checking and making it more, more and more of a pan-European effort. All right, Peter. Yeah, um, thank you, Bill and Pietro. The, so I, I uh, I'm run the Africa Check uh, website. I should say, I mean, I work for, I've worked, I'm a journalist, I've worked for 25 years or something for the AFP news agency, um, which has a foundation that supports media development, um, and it was through that that we set this up. Um, it's a fact-checking website based in South Africa at the journalism department of the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg um, with a, a team of three uh, staff, uh, an editor and two researchers. Um, we have, we're funded by donors, a number of different organizations which we, we, we list obviously, um, with the aim being uh, sort of threefold really, I think, to uh, investigate the key claims that are made in public debate um, starting in South Africa, but then we will be uh, in, the, in the next few weeks spreading to, uh, to start operating in Nigeria, and we're hoping in Kenya later in the year, and then after that in, in Senegal uh, in, in French. Um, so to investigate the key claims, to, 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 to publish the results, um, to encourage and that's one aim. The, the other is to encourage um, and enable fact-checking by others in the media in Africa. Um, fact-checking in the African media doesn't have the tradition that it does in, in American media or in the European media to some extent. Um, and it's something, it's in many ways, um, because of the problems with data that, that are available, it's, uh, I, I've, I think it's more complex. Um, 
And so what we're trying to do is, as well as doing this ourselves, to encourage others and to enable others to do that. Um, and then by basing our team at the, in the journalism department to spread that on to the next generation. Um, I mean, so far, in terms of the impact that we've, that we've had, um, we've had about uh, something over half a million visitors um, since we launched. We push out our reports to, to, to media partners, um, so they've been republished in newspapers such as the Mail and Guardian, online sites like the Daily Maverick. Um, our researchers get invited on, uh, onto radio stations and TV stations to debate the issues, debate the findings, and so on. So they, they appear on the website, but we're very conscious of the fact that uh, more than 50% of the population in Africa doesn't have access online, so we, we reach out to a wider community by, by going on radio in particular. Um, we've uh, very, we just two days ago, there's an election coming up in South Africa on Wednesday, um, and so two days ago we completed a series of uh, reports fact-checking the claims of um, the, the two major political parties um, that are contesting the elections, um, but we've ranged across a whole broad range of topics from levels of alcoholism, uh, crime, uh, gender issues, uh, health practitioners selling dodgy cures or claims of cures for, for serious diseases and, and so on. Um, and uh, as I say, the, the aim now is to, having established this in, in South Africa, is to spread it uh, in, the coming, uh, in the coming weeks to, to Nigeria and then after that um, Kenya and, and into French in Senegal. And I'll leave it there. Great. Well, um, Full Fact started in 2010 with the UK's only freestanding independent fact-checking organization. We're 80% funded by charitable foundations and have similar experiences to, to the rest in, in that respect, I think. Um, we fact-check. Um, it's perhaps a distinction worth saying that we fact-check claims rather than people. We talk a lot internally about playing the bull, not the man. Um, and obviously the same claim can spread from politician to media, media to politician. Usually there's a pressure group in there somewhere. Um, and so we check that full range of pressure groups, media and politicians. We used to have a rating system in common with most fact checkers. We actually ditched it. We found it wasn't working for us. We found it didn't make a lot of sense. Uh, in the last couple of years, we've done a lot more real time fact checking. That turns out to be absolutely the hardest thing you can possibly try to do. Um, and we are learning the skills involved in doing that. Uh, we started off with the UK's largest political current affairs discussion show, um, which vies for popularity with a show called Strictly Come Dancing, which is all about celebrities learning to dance. So in terms of its Twitter impact, those are the two, two shows that vie for the top reach in the UK. So we were on Twitter live fact-checking that show for five weeks, and over the course of five weeks, we learned a bit about how to do it. We managed to go from taking our entire team of eight down to taking four people to live fact-check that show. Um, and what we've learned um, and applied now in the European elections is that what you really need is a combination of great expertise within your own team, great preparation, as Bill's right to say that most of what you can do in real-time fact-checking is what you've done before, and also great networks into other experts. And a key part of the way Full Fact tries to work now is by linking into research organizations, academics, professional experts, so that we're tapping in not just to our own expertise, but into much greater expertise outside. The other big distinction, I think, between Full Fact and other fact-checking organizations is our emphasis on actually getting claims corrected. It's not our job simply to publish something, saying something's wrong, and leave it there. We will go to the people who made the claim originally and ask them to correct the record. We will, if necessary, go to relevant standards bodies. We will go to a reader's editor. We will go to um, the Advertising Standards Authority, people like that, and actually push for corrections using the processes that are, are available. And on top of that, where we see patterns in why things go wrong, why things are misunderstood, we will look at what systemic changes are needed to try to change those patterns. So for example, we now do a lot of work with government statisticians in the UK about how they communicate their statistics to avoid them being misunderstood. 
So we pile, I suppose, the journalistic side of fact-checking and a uh, advocacy role in terms of making sure that good information is available so people can make up their own minds wherever they're getting information from together. Um, so you mentioned uh, ratings. Why don't we, uh, let's talk a little bit about that. And uh, um, let me uh, start by uh, uh, giving a little history of the truth of meter and then I'm interested to hear why you guys had ratings and then abandoned them. So um, the uh, um, the truth of meter. So uh, the history of of Politifact uh, was that um, there was another fact checking organization, factcheck.org, in the United States, and uh, was very good, um, but it didn't do ratings, and I always felt let down. Like I would read their fact checks, and I wanted more of a conclusion, and I also wanted a summary. Um, and I felt like, particularly in a new media world, that I wanted something that um, would tell me that was false, and that was, um, that was John McCain's sixth false, or that was his sixth true, or whatever. And so when I proposed PolitiFact, I sketched out on a Word document actually something that included the truth of meter and, and so the truth of meter from the beginning was the heart of PolitiFact and I felt like um, that was key, that readers wanted it. And I, I saw fact checking as layered. Some people will, we know, you know, some people will read the full article and absorb it and consider the arguments, but we also know a lot of people will, are just browsing and they will read the headline and then move on. And so I think of, of the truth of meter as a way to just give people who are just browsers the initial information. Okay, um, Tom Corbett said that statement on Tom Wolf's watch, taxes were high, killing 100,000 Pennsylvania jobs, and he earned a mostly false. Actually, I'm gonna go to Pundit Fact because it's more fun. Um, so uh, Pundit Fact rates people who say, make statements on, uh, particularly on cable television. So oh good, so that has, I was trying to see what you're all seeing. So Sarah Palin, who's one of our favorites, um, uh, says Attorney General Eric Holder recently revealed his idea to have, uh, to have government have gun owners wear special bracelets that would identify you as a gun owner. PolitiFact rated that false. Um, so I thought, well, by having ratings, you could just give people a simple amount of information in a concise space. Sarah Palin made that statement and earned a false rating. Um, here's one, Rush Limbaugh. Some of the wealthiest Americans are African Americans now. And so uh, we rated that false. And notice our tagline, some equals Oprah. Um, so now, if you, if you click on Rush Limbaugh's name, you can see his, his report card, how many ratings he's got. And gosh, look, Rush Limbaugh's gotten a lot of false and pants on fire ratings. Um, in fact, most of his ratings are on the false and pants on fire end of the scale. I think that's valuable. And the only way you can get that value is by doing ratings. Um, otherwise, you're just doing text, and I feel like in a new media world, when we have this ability to segment information and to create structured journalism, we should take advantage of that, and so that's why we did it this way. So I'm curious, talk a little bit about how did you do ratings before, and what made you decide not to do them? Okay, um, the first thing to say is that we have never and we would never have a pants on fire category. Um, the insane whopper which Bill liked so much, I viscerally loathe as a category. Um, and I, I say this with respect, but you know, our, our whole mentality, our job is to check claims, it's not to check people, and it's certainly not to judge their intentions, of which we can have no possible evidence. Any piece of information you see on full fact should link to a primary source that lets you make your own m mind up about it. You're perfectly capable of judging whether you think the guy's lying without us telling you that. But you know what we can tell you is whether the claim stacks up or not and what evidence there is for it. So you know, let's, let's kind of segment out that part of the discussion of rating systems. Um, we have uh, 
an interesting problem with ratings. There are times when claims are clearly true or clearly false, um, but they're actually relatively few. Politics is inhabited mainly by shades of gray, and those shades of gray are largely expressed in black and white terms by people with an agenda to push politicians, uh, and in the UK, much of the media is obviously very politically aligned as well. Um, so much of what we're doing is explaining context and explaining complexity. And so you get this awkward rating in the middle problem where something, you know, is it three out of five, is it four out of five, is it two out of five, you know, and it can frankly depend on what you've had for breakfast. And there is no um, sound way that we ever discovered, no way that we felt was actually summarizing useful information for people where there isn't an unambiguous category to put things in. Actually, it became very hard to um, come up with uh, repeatable classifications. So if I gave this to separate people independently, would they come up with the same rating for it? Actually, for the stuff in the middle, probably not. So that's one problem with it. The other is that I don't think it gives you the advantages that you wish it did. We never ever generalize about the accuracy of different newspapers in the UK or different politicians because we don't do a representative or random sample. And therefore, you know, the answer to Bill's question, most insane whoppers are in Italy, what does that tell you about Italy? The answer is absolutely nothing because we don't know if it's just most of the fact checking is going on in Italy, which wouldn't surprise me given that it's kicked off by an Italian project. So I'm not sure the benefits are there in quite the way we, we would hope they would be. Great. Pietro, you want to stand up for 50-50? <laughs> so uh, Pietro's uh, middle rating is 50-50. Uh, yeah, I mean, we do have sometimes some, uh, some difficulties in, uh, in rating things because, as you said correctly, there are times when there are different nuances that are, that are hard to capture uh, with a rating system. But I do agree with Bill that it's a, a very clear and direct way of communicating with, uh, with the readers and um, you, you are presenting to the reader something that is full of uh, charts and graphs and numbers and as, uh, as one of my colleagues uh, likes to put it, it's like you're giving a uh, six-year-old, you're giving him cabbage or broccoli to eat. So if you put the rating system, if you put like some fries on the side, perhaps it's a little more uh, enticing and he might be more interested in actually reading it properly, so, so that's why we find it's a useful uh, thing to do. Um, one of the other drawbacks, I would say, perhaps, of the rating system is that people tend to be more attracted to just reading the, the whoppers, and uh, perhaps they, if they see a statement is clearly marked as true, they might not be interested in, uh, in actually clicking on it and reading the analysis, and they might be missing out on something that might be actually very interesting. So, so there is something to say about that, and you do have a point. But I would say rating systems overall uh, are, um, are effective and, uh, and people somewhat need to see a, a standard, like setting a standard for evaluation. And that, that allows for comparability and, uh, and that's why I think ultimately it's, uh, it's a useful. Peter, you want to add some fries to Africa check? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, I think the, uh, I mean, so I, I, in a classic head, uh, uh, fence sitting way I can sort of see ad I can see both points um, we we uh, Africa Tech we haven't uh, uh, had a rating system um, as a journalist I've un always understood I, I, before I did do what I do now I used to run the AFP online news service and I'd tell um, everybody who who worked for us that the most even more than in in days of uh, when everything was about print newspapers, that online, the headline is everything. Um, because people, if you go to Yahoo, or if you go to Google or, or other sites, very often you only see the headline. If you see, if you look at a, a screen in a public space, in a station or, or airport or something, you, c you can't click on the headline, you only see the headline. So the headline is, is crucial. Um, and it's, it's crucial, online particularly because um, as, uh, as Will says, if you want the in-depth information, um, you, can, you can tend to find it. If you, if you want the in-depth in information, you've, you've, got, you've got it there. But most people today don't have that much time. So what we try to do, we haven't introduced 
uh, ratings. It's something we, we review, um, and we may change, we may not. Um, but what we very much try to do is to provide a conclusion, um, and it's because, uh, it's, so it's, a, it's a, a written conclusion. It in, it in the, the conclusion will normally come in the headline. It'll say that the, the president's statement or the opposition leader's statement was misleading. It'll say that it was wrong. It'll stay, say that it's right. Um, or it'll, we'll try to find a nuanced way to do that. But we, so we try to s come somewhere between the two, providing a conclusion. There's the conclusion in the headline. There's a conclusion in a, at the top of the report. And then at the bottom of the report, there's a longer, more argued uh, conclusion. Whether we could do something that's snappier, that's more concise and so on, um, if we can, that's, and in a way that is uh, methodologically credible, then, yeah. Um, it's a great debate, and it's one, uh, obviously, that I think is uh, likely to continue. Um, so uh, let's turn to another challenge that fact checkers have, and uh, I think we've heard a, a few hints of this, and that is getting our work noticed. Um, so I know when we started PolitiFact, um, uh, I had to spell it for people, um, and the <laughs> uh, one of the biggest challenges was just trying to explain to people what we were. So I would call the Hillary Clinton campaign and say, hi, I'm Bill Adair from PolitiFact, and they would say, Polita what? Uh, they had no clue what this thing was. Uh, they didn't know what the truth of meter was, and frankly, they didn't care, you know? So we'd give them falses, half-truths, they didn't care um, because we had little audience. And it really wasn't until pretty late in the campaign that we began to get enough audience uh, that it mattered. Now, one thing that helped was we began to make appearances on NPR, our public radio network, and on CNN, um, and on uh, Morning Joe, the morning show on uh, MSNBC. So I'm interested to hear from you guys uh, what sort of growing pains have you had in getting noticed? And have you had uh, television and print partnerships that have helped you get your work out? Why don't we start with you, Pietro? Indeed, in, um, in a country where uh, digital presence is not that well spread as Italy, for instance, uh, you do have an issue with having actually impact. Uh, there was a recent report which, which accordingly uh, apparently, one third of Italians has never used the internet, and uh, perhaps you might want to fact check that. But <laughs> <laughs> um, so, in uh, in this kind of country, you obviously you work online, but you do have uh, trouble reaching a wider audience. And so, what we've uh, what we've done before, we've collaborated with uh, with news media and newspapers. But there's usually more interest in that closer to the election times. Uh, what we've done more recently is we have started uh, appearing on uh, a t uh, political talk show that is aired on uh, Rai Due, the public broadcaster in Italy. It's called Virus. And so we have an appearance every, every week. We have a five-minute time where we present the most interesting facts from the week. And uh, that is hugely important in getting our work noticed out there. Uh, the drawbacks are that you're appearing on television in very little time and you cannot have a proper analysis with all your links to the sources, so you lose a bit of depth of analysis, but you do manage to reach a much broader public. So, so there are ways to, to go about it and to collaborate with other uh, media sources to actually increase our, our reach and getting people to notice. And how about for Fact Check EU? So you've got a lot of countries you're trying to, to reach are you doing things and you know beyond just translations in those countries, or is it because you're so new, have you not had a chance to really pursue those? Uh, there is quite some interest now picking up as uh, news organizations around Europe realize that the elections are I in just a few weeks' time. So um, we do have some interest in, uh, in various national markets. Uh, we have newspapers that have been writing about us, and uh, we are starting some uh, cooperations with uh, some news. For instance, we have a uh, partnership with Die Zeit in, in Germany. Uh, it's a, one of the biggest and uh, best uh, reputed uh, newspapers there. Um, so there is some interest there, but the, the fear is that it might just wane after the, the campaign is over. So 
we'll have to find some ways to uh, make sure that this doesn't happen. And if not, it might just remain something of interest for the EU media once it's over, and we wouldn't want that. Sure. Peter, now you guys um, see yourself as not just fact-checking, but as uh, sort of the, uh, the old story, uh, don't just give a man a fish, uh, teach a man to fish. Um, because you, on your site, talk about here's how to fact check and whatever. Um, talk about some of the things that you do to make your work available. Like, uh, you know, to put it in the Globe and Mail, you do you give it away free uh, under Creative Commons, or how do you do that? And what are you what what are you doing to encourage fact checking in Africa? Sure. Um, well, yeah. I, I mean, so the the first thing that we're very conscious of is that um, we have currently. I mean, we're uh, we're about to increase our audience, our, uh, our staffing um, by a huge percentage, going from three to four people. Um, on a continent of a billion people, or, or about a billion people, um, it's, it's not so many. So we're conscious that it would be, um, I mean, there, we, we believe we're the first fact-checking website operating in, in Africa. Um, it's not a common thing in the African media, therefore, as well as doing what we're doing, we're trying very hard to stimulate um, uh, and enable others uh, to do the same. We want to be the a sort of gold star standard for fact checking, but to, to stimulate others to do the same um, as we're doing. Um, so we, when we set up, we, we, we are, everybody involved in the project comes from a journalistic background. Um, we've started in South Africa and we have people who have a lot of contacts in the media who've worked for media houses. And so we've worked hard to put, we push out all, all of our reports to a media list. They get picked up in the, let's say in the, in the Mail and Guardian, in the Daily Maverick site, in Daily News and the Independent uh, papers. We get our researchers brought uh, on air uh, very regularly on, on the, in the main radio stations. We try to work with community radio stations so it reaches different parts of the community. Um, we also have um, on the site a section called How to Fact Check, as, as you mentioned. Um, that is trying to provide tips and advice for people, um, whether they're journalists or whether they're members of the general public, on how to unpick a claim. Because this isn't something that most journalists find easy. When we, when we started this up, um, we worked with a lot of uh, people doing as, as researchers for us, and we found that they were unable, despite 10, 20 years in the profession, um, to, uh, to, to check a claim accurately. So we, we're trying to provide advice on that. Um, and then we're trying, we, we launched, um, in partnership with the AFP Foundation um, that I work for, we've launched a, a fact-checking prize, uh, the African Fact-Checking Prize, for, for people from different um, uh, African media, uh, uh, and there's a, there's a prize, it's 2,000 euros for the top prize and 1,000 euros each for two runners-up um, for people working for African media who have produced a report, be it uh, in a newspaper, print newspaper, on a site, a TV, radio, whatever it is, that unpicks a, uh, uh, and exposes a misleading claim from their country. Um, and that's got a lot of interest. Um, so, I mean, where we see we have, I mean, we've grown, our, the audience of the site has grown from about 5,000 visitors a month uh, when we, in the first couple of months after we launched, to about 50 to 60,000 now. But when we, uh, when the daily, when the, the Mail and Guardian runs our report, it's got a million visitors to its site. When we go out on Power FM, they reach about 5 million people. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a no-brainer for us that if we can, we want our, our reports carried um, more widely. Great. Well, how about you guys? What, um, how do you, s when you start an organization like Full Fact from scratch, um, how do you get recognized? Um, I think the first thing we needed to be recognized for was doing really high quality work and actually being understood as not having an agenda to push. Um, so in a sense, the, the goal in the first place was for people, you know, a, a pretty narrow group of people to read our stuff and decide, oh, actually, these people are trying to do this seriously and there isn't an ulterior motive. 
um, getting it out to a wider audience is um, exactly what Peter described. And it's interesting that the model seems to work in exactly the same way um, in both the UK and in Africa. It's all about other media. However popular our website might ever grow, ultimately the Guardian and the Mail will have vastly larger audiences than we can reach. And even they are relatively irrelevant. Um, if you look at where people get most of their news in the UK, if I asked you to put your hands up, what's your main source of news about what's going on in your country, I'm willing to bet that everybody in this room would say the internet. If you ask that same question, when you ask that same question in the UK, the internet gets, I think, about 11%. It's some, somewhere in, in the low teens. Newspapers are in a similar um, bracket. TV is the main source of news for 74% of people about what's going on in the UK. And so if you want to get your name out there, you have to get on TV. And have you? Um, yeah, increasingly we are being asked to do interviews. Um, we are, you know, this partnership with, we did with BBC Question Time, that was actually with, with the online side of the programme, but at one stage trailed in the programme. So we're, we're beginning to get those invitations. We, when we did the fact-checking of the debates on the future of Britain in Europe, we did that um, firstly with LBC Radio, which was hosting the first debate, and then with um, the independent newspaper for the second debate. We were on the Today programme, which is the sort of most prominent current affairs show um, in the UK, uh, twice in a week, which is quite a big deal, and also on BuzzFeed. So we're finding quite interestingly that although our core material is uh, not as uh, kind of uh, strongly expressed as PolitiFact's output, actually we can adapt what we produce to everywhere from BuzzFeed to BBC Radio 4. And sometimes it's about um, working out how to present the same content in the right format for the right place. But certainly there's an appetite for it. Cool. So um, let's switch gears and talk a little bit about um, crowdsourcing. Um, Pietro is really intrigued um, by uh, how your users upload statements and I, I saw that on your website. Um, so explain in a little more detail how that works. They establish an account and then they um, and then they can upload a statement and say fact check this or how exactly does that work? Basically, users, um, they can create their own profile, and it's, it's very simple. Uh, and then what they can do is they can, exactly, they can uh, upload a statement. It needs to be a fact-checkable statement. There needs to be a link to the original source. And, and then it goes internally, and then we either approve it or not, or explain why this is not a fact-checkable statement. Mm -hmm. um, and then once it's approved, then it's open for either us or someone from the crowd to, to fact-check it. Uh, so that's one, one of the aspects. Um, and th that is actually very useful, especially in, in Europe, where we have uh, some issues with language barriers. So we cannot manage by ourselves to cover uh, everything. And so it's very useful when people um, upload statements from countries that we do not manage to monitor as effectively due to just uh, language barriers. So that's a very useful instrument. And uh, the other thing is um, translations. That's really great as well. Um, because we publish our material uh, only in English at the beginning, and we try to provide some translations ourselves, but we struggle a bit to offer immediately our content in the six languages altogether. And, uh, and people do send their translations, so, so that's, that's great, because it's not the most interesting part of the work, I would say. Uh, but people do send them over, and, uh, and then we just review them internally, and, uh, and then we publish them. And that's, uh, that's really great, because it shows that there's a, um, there's a wish to make the, the fact check available into readers into other languages, so that's, uh, that's really great. Um, when people upload fact checks, so they actually go through a statement and provide an analysis, I would say we have mixed results with that. Uh, some, some people actually do send well-researched analyses uh, with the links to the sources, and, uh, and then we review them internally, and, um, and there is a process a bit of going uh, back and forth. Uh, with, the, with the author, with the user who uploaded it. Um, it can be very useful in that it can make our work easier if it's well done, but at times we have found the, the quality of the fact checks we receive from the crowd not at best. So um, sometimes it might be opinionated, 
it might be biased uh, or that, that the, the depth of analysis might be a bit lacking. Uh, in one case, we had an analysis that was shorter than the claim. So <laughs> <laughs> just thought, okay, what are we supposed to do with he that? He is a liar. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. <laughs> uh, but the issue is that we don't want to discourage the, someone who has somewhat gone through the trouble. So we go back to the user and we say, we make suggestions and we say, okay, you might want to point this out, you might want to link to this source. And this can take a lot of, this can be time consuming. So in a way, it does absorb a lot of the energies of our staff. So, so with, the, with the actual fact checks, there are, uh, I would say overall the experiment is quite positive, but, uh, and the, the hope is that users gradually will become more, uh, will gain experience doing fact checks and so they will improve gradually and that will contribute to a better crowd. I gotta say, uh, this is one where I take Will's uh, uh, visceral response on ratings. Um, my response on crowdsourcing is that it is great for suggesting claims to check, um, but that the crowd that reads fact checking is often so passionate about politics that I just don't think it can be objective about writing a fact check. And to me, it's like, it would be like reading a, um, it would be like reading Media Matters, which is a partisan fact checking site in the United States. And, um, and I think it would take so much work. And we saw this, there was an effort to do a, a crowdsourced fact checking site in the United States called uh, Truth Squad. And it never got off the ground because one, nobody wanted to do the homework. Fact, you know, fact checking's hard, and it, you know, it takes a lot of homework, and who wants to do that as a hobby? You know, it's like, it's hard enough as a job. I, I mean, I would not want to spend my free time doing that. Um, I mean, I love it as a job, but geez. So, <laughs> so I, uh, um, uh, there were some guys, very well-meaning guys. We did a thing with um, Jake Tapper uh, when he was at ABC where we fact-checked uh, this week, uh, the, the Sunday morning show, and um, David Gregory, the host of Meet the Press, was sort of a, uh, aloof. Who would think uh, David Gregory would be kind of aloof? He um, uh, refused to do one at meet the press and so some students, I think they were in Kansas, said, well, we'll do a crowdsourced fact check of meet the press. And so, um, and they did it for a couple of months and were like, this is really hard. And um, so, I, so they gave up. So I'm, I'm very skeptical that crowdsourcing beyond suggesting claims, I think it works wonderfully for suggesting claims and PolitiFact gets probably one third of the claims that it checks from suggestions from readers. Um, but beyond that, I don't think it can work. I don't know, do you disagree? Um, How do, what, what do you guys, do you do much crowdsourcing for Africa Check? Um, so we, we do. Um, in fact, when we, when we started up, um, we had uh, two sections on the site. One was called um, uh, uh, send us a claim or, or have you got a claim for us to check? Um, and the other one was can you help us? And so it was, you know, can you send in um, uh, information that will enable us to check, you know, um, a claim. We said that we were um, looking at, uh, we'd say that we were looking at this issue that week and c could people help us. Um, we always got, we've, we've always uh, had people sending in suggestions. Um, my favorite was um, somebody said that his brother-in-law um, was in charge of a hospital department in South Africa and he was convinced that he was a thief and could we please investigate his brother-in-law because he never should have married um, uh, his sister. So we respectfully declined. Um, but um, we get a lot of good suggestions and it's, it's interesting, in fact, uh, I'm very interested that the, uh, it's about, about a similar proportion of our reports um, are based on reader suggestions. Um, and we have a system of, of sifting what we do so that we, at one point we were getting um, there was obviously a campaign to send us suggestions um, to, to target uh, a particular uh, claims by a particular political party. Um, uh, and so we don't just do whatever people send in. We, we have to maintain our neutrality by saying um, that you know, we'll check uh, the different sides in, in 
in, in proportion, um, but where the claims are good and where they sit within that, then they're, they're a great source. Um, what I haven't yet found is um, many people willing to put in the hours, um, exactly. which I, I completely understand, because these things can take, can take a long time um, to uh, to do so, it, it works on the on the suggestion side. I haven't found it work on the people helping us. I think there's a real risk um, on both sides. Actually, I, we used to we used to have a sort of function called suggest a fact check before we realized, but it basically sounded like there, there are these fact checkers in the sky who you may humbly ask to go and fact check something, and we will consider whether we will do the thing you have suggested. Um, and, and I think there's a danger of kind of making fact-checking an elite thing um, by not involving people or by the language we use to try to involve people. And so we've started talking about tip us off and that kind of thing and recognizing the expertise of the people who read and use full fact. And, and so I, I do think um, in order to do fact-checking effectively, you are actually dependent on reaching into a wide network of people who know what they're talking about. But I also agree with these guys that a wide network of people who know what they're talking about and the people who are motivated to write aren't necessarily the same people. And I, I would be interested in, in the editing process because my hunch is for us to have assurance that what we were publishing was up to our standards, we would more or less have to redo the fact check from scratch if we, because you have to understand so much of a context, you have to understand so much of, if I interpreted this a different way, would I reach a different conclusion? Or is there another data set I could be looking at which the person who's done this fact check hasn't found or has chosen not to mention? So I, I, I'm not sure <laughs> how much time you save. Yeah, I mean, there is, uh, occasionally there is quite a lot of editing involved, um, but but I do agree, as you said, that uh, in some cases, some checks might be very technical and uh, you might not have the appropriate expertise. So sometimes you can actually tap into an expertise that uh, would otherwise be unavailable. And the, the hardest bit is researching the, the facts rather than writing about it. So if you have a, a crowd system where you can tap into expertise and they just direct you to the, uh, the sources and guide you through them, then that can be very helpful, and then you can do the editing work. So, but there is sometimes quite some extensive editing that is required, and that does take some time. But on the other hand, we do save some time with, uh, with the researching. So that can be helpful. So let's switch gears and talk about fact-checking the media, um, which is a relatively, uh, relatively few of us fact-check the media. So. Uh, I just put up on the screen Pundit Fact, which I mentioned earlier. This was a project that uh, PolitiFact started last fall. It's uh, unlike the rest of PolitiFact. Pundit Fact is funded by foundations, by the Democracy Fund, which is an Omidyar organization, uh, and by the Ford Foundation, and by Craig Newmark, the founder of Craigslist. And, uh, and so it fact checks uh, talk show hosts and people who appear in the media, uh, people like Sarah Palin and Rush Limbaugh, uh, Matt Drudge. Um, and uh, uh, it's relatively unusual, the people in the United States who do fact checking, uh, prime, uh, well, all of them uh, do just fact check uh, politicians. And uh, so I was interested to see that full fact uh, fact checks uh, the media um, and calls out mistakes uh, as you did this week, uh, a big mistake on the front page of The Guardian. Um, and so I'm curious why, um, why do we not see more, you know, as fact checking gets, picks up steam, we're seeing all, all this fact checking now around the world, why are we not seeing more fact checking of the media? Um, largely because fact checking is done by the media. Uh -huh. You know, uh, full fact checks claims, um, and therefore the fact that we check media outlets is a byproduct of that, um, because we're checking the claim, not necessarily the people who are making them. Um, but most fact checking organizations, and in fact there was um, Channel 4 uh, in the UK had a fact checking blog uh, before full fact existed. Of course it doesn't check the media, because journalists aren't, aren't going to 
you know, annoy their potential future employers. Media institutions aren't going to annoy other media institutions. Um, and I'd be interested to know counterexamples to that, but I imagine they're relatively rare. <laughs> okay. uh, if, I, if I can just say, if I just say on that, I mean, uh, as I say, I, I've been a journalist for 25 years um, or, or more. Um, a lot of the, uh, uh, the, the, the organisations that backs um, Africa Check is a thing called the African Media Initiative, uh, AMI, which um, was founded, I think, in 2007, and it brings together 450 um, or so uh, news organisations around Africa. And so the members are all CEOs or owners or, or chief editors of media organisations across the continent. Um, one of my board members is one of uh, the founders of AMI, and he was very keen that we do fact check the media. Um, we wanted to do so from the start. Um, in fact, I, so I was on a panel um, with the, the head of AMI earlier this week on the future of the African media, and he pointed out the importance of doing this, um, saying he'd just been um, early last month in Rwanda for the commemorations of the 20th anniversary of the genocide in which uh, Radio Milkolin and other <coughs> media houses played a, a huge part. Um, and so, um, but so our board member sort of made that point to us and then he also made the point that when the media talks as the media often does, obviously not with one voice, um, <coughs> about the importance of self-regulation if media does get involved in fact-checking itself, it's a much better system for everybody, we think, in the media than if um, we invite uh, governments and regulators to do so. And uh, I mean, Eric Jinje, who's a very experienced Cameroonian uh, journalist who's on our board, um, made this point that when he now goes on behalf of the African Media Initiative to places like Ethiopia, where they're detaining journalists, um, and he, he uses the example of Africa Check as a media-backed organization that regularly, we regularly call out news organizations. And if I give you one example of where it works, um, early, on in, uh, early on last year, um, uh, a great website in South Africa called Daily Maverick um, published a, uh, a report um, that was uh, suggesting that a, a prominent uh, Muslim family in South Africa um, was running Al-Qaeda uh, training camps um, in, the, in, in part of the country. Um, the report was uh, completely misleading. There were many, many statements in it that were simply wrong and the, and the whole conclusions were, were misleading. We ran a piece pointing this out. Um, the Daily Maverick withdrew the report and the Daily Maverick is, is our biggest um, supporter in the media. They publish almost everything that we do. And we, th there was a discussion internally. We were, uh, you know, we don't want to bite the hand that is that, as we were saying, getting this, getting our stuff out through the media works. But we can't have credibility if we don't look at the media as well. And we think, and the, my board is convinced, um, and so the majority of members of the, of the board are, are, have a media background themselves, that it is, this is a, a fantastic way for the media to do what we always talk about of self-regulation. You know, it's much, much better than some bureaucrat in Whitehall or, or whatever the um, whatever the institution is. Can I just come mm. come back on that? Because um, I mean, Peter makes a, a really sound point, and I shouldn't have generalised away from from the UK and what I was saying. I, I think that um, I still struggle to imagine UK media organisations fact checking other media organisations, particularly because of how politically aligned our mm. newspapers are. But Peter's absolutely right, and it's worth noting that on our board we have two um, very experienced journalists, and that Full Fact is founded on the premise that actually journalism is important and politics is important, and that the best people who do them are thoroughly committed to doing it well. Um, and that's been my experience, and it's one of the reasons why I'm so uncomfortable with the kind of pants on fire insane whopper school of fact checking, is actually there's an inbuilt cynicism to that set of dis descriptions, which I don't think is totally justified. Um, I, I think that, you know, there is a real strong 
um, school of thought in journalism in the UK and I would imagine elsewhere, and actually in politics as well, which is that we want to get our facts right. Um. Um, you know, I, I th I'm glad to hear the media uh, people that you work with are supportive. Um, Not always, be but... <laughs> um, <laughs> because I think um, my experience is more like yours that in the United States, well, look at the playing field, there's no other news organization that is fact-checking other news organizations. It's just not happening. And, um, and it took, um, and I think it's also interesting that um, we, don't, um, we don't yet have a big media partnership for Pundit Fact. Um, we have um, we, we do some with some regional media, uh, with some regional television, um, but not a, not, we have some on the web. We don't have a regional, we don't have a national television partnership yet. Um, but, um, and, and, and just to understand that, um, uh, there, I've had a couple of experiences where uh, national media personalities have cheered me on and said, you know, oh, I love what you're doing, you know, go fact check. And one of them even said, fact check me. And then we fact checked. <laughs> and then this particular person just, you know, blew a gasket at our fact check and was like, you know, how dare you give us a, give me a half true. Um, and, uh, and the other one got a false and was like, you know, uh, sent me this, you know, emails saying how wrong we were and everything. And um, so, I, you know, I find that people in the media, even those who, who cheer fact-checking, um, don't um, seem to like the scrutiny themselves. And, um, and I found that their defenses, and I, you know, obviously people can disagree about a rating, um, and, um, but I found that their defenses were not persuasive. And um, so, um, and I, it was funny, when I started PolitiFact, I sort of thought people would be like, um, much more polite about the ratings. And the right ratings become these flashpoints, you know, for, um, for people to just blow up and, and sometimes just go crazy. I mean, it's wild. And it's wonderful. And this is where, I mean, I just think it's great we disagree about this. Um, ratings um, make people go crazy sometimes. And isn't that terrible that we've created journalism that makes people talk and makes people debate and makes people write responses and makes people pay attention to substantive journalism. And that's what ratings do. And that's what, you know, a half true um, about a complicated policy topic um, can prompt all these discussions. And, you know, PolitiFact got it wrong. You know, here's why PolitiFact got it wrong. No, PolitiFact got it right. And so um, a rating does that. And um, whereas you can have a long, uh, thoughtful article with pros and cons, and your audience is going to be tiny because it's like vegetables, gang. Um, you know, it's like um, you need french fries. And so I really think ratings are critical. And, and I really think that ratings are also very valuable at getting your work on television because television wants french fries. So anyway, fun that we disagree on that. Okay, so we have, um, we got about 10 minutes. What, um, are there any questions from the audience? Um, uh, which put your hand up, and I think we have some microphones so that you're picked up on the streaming video, um, which I hope is streaming somewhere. <laughs> Maybe they're watching us in the United States or South Africa. Um, okay, we've got a question here. Uh, I, have a, I have a question on uh, what do you think the um, mission is in terms of uh, fact-checking sites, whether it is of uh, changing uh, demand so electorate or supply, so what, specifically with political fact-checking, to what politicians are saying. Uh, I'm obviously terribly biased, as I am Pietro's colleague, uh, but uh, in, in that sense, if we are not just looking for, to get uh, politicians to speak better, but also to get electorate curious about uh, data and statistics and actually to go find it themselves, 
then to um, spur crowd checking, even if it's hard, even if it uh, waits a lot of time, uh, then that may be uh, collateral damage that, is, uh, that makes sense uh, if, if that is your mission. So, in other words, is the mission to get politicians to stop lying, or is the mission to inform democracy? Um, and and I'm, I'm gl really glad you asked that, because that was actually on our <laughs> list that we didn't get to it. So now we'll get to it. Pietro, why don't you tackle that one to, to start? Um, I would say <laughs> this is somewhat of an internal discussion we have with Alex every day. Um, I would say probably the two of us agree that it's both. Um, so on the one hand, yeah, we do want to make politicians accountable, and, and the rating system achieves just that. I mean, you are somewhat rewarding a politician that says, gets his facts right, and you are naming and shaming the politician that does not get his facts correct. So on the one hand, we're uh, talking to the politicians and getting them to correct their, be their behavior and getting their, uh, their uh, stats right. But on the other hand, we, we do also hope that, in a way, the electorate is, gets more interested into seeing how politicians, uh, if politicians know what they're talking about. And uh, it's a little bit ambitious to say that the electorate actually then changes its mind on, on, on the basis of, uh, of our rating system. Um, there tends to be more, uh, more ideology and, uh, and supporting your, uh, your team no matter what. But one of our objectives is indeed to get people to, uh, to be more interested into the actually how the, the numbers are, what the facts are, and, uh, and then to be, to be more curious and actually look into the, the links we put and, uh, and go to see the primary sources and read the reports and get them more, uh, more curious about these things. So I would say we have both missions. Will, you want to tackle that one? I think that when we think about impacts, we always think about risks as well as benefits. And one of the risks of doing fact checking is that you spend all your time making well-informed people even better informed. And actually the people who look at polit political websites are a tiny minority of the country who already know, frankly, far more about these things um, than most people um, and very often have made their minds up. So it's really important to be circumspect about what you can actually achieve by publishing a political website. Um, and so actually, if your goal is to influence the wider public and the wider public debate, then your goal inherently must be to influence the behavior of the people who influence the wider public, i.e. the media and politicians and pressure groups who are, who are pushing information out that gets really <laughs> wide circulation and wide coverage. Um, so I'm not sure that the dichotomy really exists in practice w when you look at where you have to go with it. <laughs> we see our remit as educational. Um, it's about giving people information and tools to make up their own minds on issues that matter, whether those people are members of the public or ministers and journalists. Um, we provide tools like Full Fact Finder, which is all about getting you to data quickly. We provide tools like Fact Checks, which are helping you get an answer quickly. Um, and we're, we're building more things to help people do that. But um, it's ultimately an empowering mission, but we have to be realistic. There is not a crowd of people out there just waiting to spend all their time digging into the data about politics. And frankly, I'd hate to live in the country where there were. If you look at the UK, serious research in the UK about what people think about politics, fewer than 10% of us follow politics in an intent way. You know, you know the people who follow politics the way other people follow football. That's a tiny proportion of the country who cares about who's up and who's down and what's being argued about lately. Then about 30, 40% of us care about issues. We care about schools, hospitals, you know, that kind of thing. We might have written to an MP or signed a petition in the last three years, in other words. And then only two thirds of people in the UK vote in our general elections, which leads a third of people who don't even vote. Now those aren't you know, rigorous, mutually exclusive categories, but there's a rule of thumb about how much we care about politics. That's a pretty good breakdown of the UK, and it, it's not too dissimilar from a, a lot of European countries. So the idea that there is or could be a massive appetite for banging on about politics all the time, I don't think so. 
And so you've got to know who your audience is. And then if you want to think about the effects on the broad public, you've got to think about what issues people care about and where, where we're getting our information from about them. Uh, another question. We didn't hear Peter's take on I that. I know, I just was trying to mix it up here uh, if there was another question. But if there's not, we'll, uh, Peter and I will tackle that one. Okay. Peter, tackle that one. Um, well, I mean, I, 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 it would just be a sort of short point, really, that, um, I mean, I, I, I think we, uh, so we, we'd see two aims. I, I, I'd agree that um, they're sort of two sides of the same coin. On the one hand, we aim to get, uh, to put a, uh, an element of, it's the carrot and the stick. We aim to put some, some element of fear into the politician or the journalist or, or whoever it might be who is knowingly making a misleading statement. Um, uh, there was a, a colleague uh, who worked for uh, Channel 4 Fact Check, one of the, the sites uh, run by the Channel 4 news, uh, news Channel in the UK, who said that they'd heard that um, uh, the that officials in one of the in the the leader's office in one of the political parties in the UK now talk about can we get this past the fast past the fact checkers? That's that's a, a very healthy thing in my in my view. Um, but fundamentally, it's not all about politics. What we're at the deepest level, what we're trying to do is to stimulate the questioning reflex um, amongst journalists, amongst members of the general public. It might be that it's when your neighbor says something disparaging about another neighbor that you think, well, hold on, you know, have you got any evidence for the thing that you're saying? So it's not at the political level, it's a reflex. And I think that, uh, I mean, the most encouraging thing to me is that there are 27 new sites since January 2012, um, that this is, why, why is that, why is there funding available, why are their audiences growing? We've had a very positive response um, online and elsewhere. I think it's because people recognize in their own lives and not just in the realm of party politics or what have you, um, that you need when people make claims to question where that claim comes from. And that's a useful reflex to kickstart. Uh, I totally agree and I, we've had similar experiences in the United States. Uh, I had a gentleman come up to me after a panel and say, uh, I'll tell you a story about the impact of fact-checking. I worked for the mayor of Atlanta. Um, when PolitiFact Georgia started, the mayor called me into his office and said, um, I never want to get any rating lower than a mostly true. Make it happen. Um, make sure that nothing I say is ever lower than a mostly true. And I thought that was great. Um, we know that in the Obama campaign, there were meetings where the research team would meet with the people making commercials, and the, the people making the commercials would say, okay, here's what we would like the next commercial to say. And the research team would say, well, if you say that, PolitiFact will give it a false. And the, and the commercial people would say, well, what if we say it this way? And the research people would say, well, PolitiFact will give that a half true. And the commercial people would say, okay, that's what we'll say. <laughs> so um, uh, we know we're having an impact. Um, I think of it like the police officer with the radar gun on the highway. Um, you know, uh, uh, he's not going to stop every speeder, um, but people know he's out there and that uh, some people are going to slow down as a result. Um, I think there's no question that fact-checking is having an impact, um, not just in the United States, but around the world. I'm very proud to uh, be a part of it, and, uh, and it's really exciting to see the work that these guys are doing and, uh, and the growth of fact-checking around the world. So uh, appreciate you coming to the panel today. Um, I want to thank these guys, and I uh, hope you'll join me in talking.